This anime begins by showing us planet Earth and a mysterious object falling onto it. Then, it introduces us to the commander of an evil organization that fights daily to exterminate humanity and allow their native celestial body to take over the planet. However, today he was on his day off, and this man would queue up to see the pandas. He tells us that the first thing he will do is delight in delicacies in the sight, especially if it's with creatures of fluffy fur. The man was dedicated to recording pandas and was frequently observed by several children out of curiosity. A child asked him if his affection for pandas was getting out of hand, as he was taking too many photos and videos too frequently. This man comments that, after exterminating humans, he will increase the population of panda bears. The main objective of days off is to disconnect from the routine of work. If he had the misfortune of spotting a colleague, he had to slip away as fast as a shooting star. Then, if someone asks or inquires about what he does on his days off, he will play ignorant. However, when he's on his days off, he must be careful not to encounter the rangers, who are humans foolish enough to seek fights daily. However, today he plans to refuse to fight and ignore them because he wants to prioritize the pandas. A red-haired boy approached the protagonist and asked if he was part of the evil organization, as he felt a very dark force around him. The protagonist remained silent and looked at the red-haired boy, emitting a dense dark aura. The red-haired boy tells him that he had the misfortune of encountering a ranger during his guard duty. He prepared to fight, and he tells the protagonist that he is the Red Ranger. However, the protagonist proposed a truce of peace just for today, explaining that he likes panda bears, so he doesn't want to disturb their peace with fighting. The ranger was surprised to hear this and mentioned that he also likes pandas. The protagonist praised him for having good taste and noticed that he had a ticket in his hand, asking if that was for the aquarium. The ranger hid this, and our protagonist deduced that the ranger was actually supposed to patrol the aquarium, but being absent-minded, he didn't realize it. The ranger was alarmed to hear this, and the protagonist recommended that he go to Uenono Station and get off at the ninth stop to reach the aquarium. The black-haired man was about to leave, but the ranger stopped him, saying that he has a poor sense of direction and doesn't know how to get to the station. The protagonist decided to guide and accompany the red ranger to the station. After this, he returned to see the pandas, even if he had to wait in line, as it was his day off, and he wanted to make the most of it. Later, the protagonist went to a convenience store and checked every shelf, grabbed a basket, and started putting all the things he would need, wondering why there was so much variety of the same product. However, among all the merchandise in the store, there is one particular product that he likes. He went to the ice cream fridge and was surprised to see that the sweet potato ice cream had been replaced by another product. He tried to find the sweet potato ice cream, and the store employee noticed. She hoped that the protagonist would take the machai ice cream, as it is the tastiest in her opinion. And just at that moment, the black-haired man decided to grab the ice cream and commented that if the ice cream doesn't turn out to be good enough, he will destroy the store. He approached the cashier to pay for the products he needed. She noticed that the protagonist took the machai ice cream and was delighted. She took the opportunity to tell him that it's a delicious ice cream and recommended it to him. The black-haired man remained silent and accepted the girl's recommendation, bidding her farewell. The protagonist went back to his apartment and sat in the living room to try the ice cream. He finished the ice cream completely and was surprised by the taste, saying that it's not so bad. He comments that in the near future, he will eliminate humanity from the earth, but he will probably leave that store until the end. At night, the Red Ranger visited the same store and would buy some meat fritters that were made to celebrate a collaboration with the Rangers. The store girl recognized the red-haired man and was amazed to see him. The Ranger took the opportunity to ask her for a location, and she directed him, but despite that, the Ranger got lost. The next day, the protagonist woke up and was glad to have another day off. He would go through his daily routine and prepared breakfast, realizing that he should buy more food because his refrigerator was empty. Here, they explain that the protagonist is on vacation and wants to make the most of it since he wants to investigate living beings called animals, as these did not exist on the planet he came from. But among all the animals, the one that caught his attention the most was the panda. It was the first time he had seen such a creature, so even though it was his day off, he decided to investigate pandas for a day. He tells us that this technically counts as part of the job since he is researching a species. For that reason, he has requested vacation time from his organization so that when he finishes, he can be compensated and recover the missing days. The protagonist continued to investigate the zoo and wondered why there were more species than just pandas. There, he realized that there were tigers and lions. He wondered why humans can find such dangerous animals, 
thinking they must have some intention and wrongly deduce that the zoo is actually an experimental laboratory. This would make him angry, unleashing his evil aura, which scared civilians, causing them to flee for their lives. The protagonist comments that if that's the case, he cannot let his guard down, but for now, his mission is the panda. The next day, he documented his research with a report. Despite it possibly being a laboratory, he wanted to visit it again for the pandas. Back to the present, this is how the protagonist gradually discovered the existence of pandas and his fondness for them. The protagonist decided to go to a supermarket, where the Red Ranger would stop him, thanking him for helping him find the aquarium. As a token of his gratitude, he bought him a gift. It was a box of panda-shaped cookies. He approached the protagonist and handed it to him. The protagonist took the box of cookies and entered the store. The ranger asked him if the peace truce still stands, but the protagonist did not respond and instead did his shopping, explaining that he won't fight with the rangers today because it's his day off. He tells us that he must now be more careful on his days off because he not only has to worry about the rangers but also his own colleagues since he met one of them in the supermarket. The protagonist always wants to prioritize his days off over work because he wants to fully investigate pandas before extinguishing humanity. However, despite narrowly avoiding being discovered by his colleagues, he was annoyed that they interrupted his days off. In this way, he was about to explode with rage and exterminate humanity since amidst so much stress and interruptions. He couldn't buy a decent amount of food and could only buy some extra spicy noodles. Before exploding completely, his TV showed a panda documentary, and he decided to watch it, relaxing and forgetting what he was about to do. Several weeks later, the protagonist would have another day off. He decided to visit a place that humans called a shopping mall. Two children approached the protagonist and grabbed his coat, mistaking him for their father. The protagonist thought it was an enemy attack and was about to defend himself, but he stopped upon the confusion of being called father. They asked the protagonist to buy them ice cream. He asked them if their parents had never taught them not to accept food from strangers, which the children, who were siblings, denied. This annoyed the protagonist a bit, questioning what parents do to educate the children of the planet. He decided to buy ice cream for the children and thought about taking them to the lost children's center. The girl would trip and drop her ice cream, starting to cry. The protagonist asked her if she was okay, feigning calm and seriousness on the outside but feeling panicked inside. The boy told the protagonist that his sister would probably cheer up if they ate at that store. He decided to take the girl there. After that, he left them at the Lost Children's Center. The siblings bid farewell to the black-haired man, saying they would see him again soon. The protagonist knew that would never happen, but he was glad to hear it. After this, the protagonist left. The children remained serious as they watched our protagonist leave, saying that in the end, he's not so evil. The boy commented that it's normal since not all villains are the same. They were only watching him today, but the next time they crossed paths with him, they would fight. At that moment, the Red Ranger appeared, happy that they finally returned, and he left with the children, who turned out to be other rangers. Meanwhile, we see the protagonist in the souvenir shop, finding a section dedicated to pandas. There he found a shirt featuring a panda and its cub. This moved the protagonist a little, who didn't hesitate to take the panda shirt. Dear mother, who rests cryogenically frozen on our distant homeworld, how are you? These were the words of a child, for he was finally going to be able to travel to Earth, and not only that, he had a job in the evil organization of which he was proud. He was eager to return home to tell everyone about his travels and accomplishments, but he acknowledges that it's not too easy to travel from one planet to Earth, and vice versa. It's also not very easy to relate to the members of the organization, as they don't even know the name of the person in charge. This is because he has such high power and ego that allow him to rise above others. For that reason, they usually call him general out of respect. This general was our protagonist, who was fighting on his own with all the rangers. We switch scenes to the Tower of the Evil Organization, where we see the general in his office full of anger. One of his colleagues, who is an albino, entered the office to have lunch with him, but the protagonist refused, arguing that he was very busy. He blamed himself for not being able to take a personal day, and they show us that he was referring to a raffle to be able to see the pandas in person and interact with them, especially with that panda that was about to give birth soon and the winner of the raffle could see the newborn cub. We switch scenes to the same child as before, who was tired of so much paperwork and reports. He was the only one working, as the rest of his colleagues had gone to lunch. The protagonist went to the offices and found the child. 
he decided to ask him if he was the new one who had recently joined the organization. The child was frightened and at the same time, proud to see the general again. The protagonist scolded him because his work hours had ended long ago and he needed him to leave. The boy explained that he wanted to finish at least one more report before leaving, apologizing for being so slow to write. The general took the report and reviewed it, realizing they were optional reports. The protagonist advised him to take breaks and not overdo it with reports since most of the reports weren't so necessary to be delivered on the same day. After all, the home world wouldn't annex Earth to its domains in just one day. And he clarified that these orders are because they are in a war of attrition, so he must take care of his body and mind not to end up burnt out. As a reward for his efforts, he gave him a day off and asked him to make an effort to enjoy it. The child wondered how he could make the most of his day off, so he researched using the organization's computer and connecting to the internet discovering something that caught his attention. Two days later, the boy went to the general's office to tell him that he went to the zoo and there he met the pandas. He clarified in his report that he would like to return to that place someday. He also mentioned that he knows his fondness for pandas, so he was curious to see what they were like. So, as a thank you for the day off, he gave him a box of panda cookies. The protagonist looked at the box and congratulated him, saying it wasn't bad at all. The child couldn't bear the embarrassment anymore and left the office totally red. The rest of his colleagues noticed and approached him to see if he was okay, as he melted in front of them. Here they tell us that one of this child's dreams is to become the right hand of the general, and wants to strive more every day to be able to work with him. Later, we see the protagonist at home trying the cookies that the newcomer gave him, however. He wasn't able to eat the cookies because the panda design was too adorable, and he couldn't eat them, so he left each cookie on the floor and waited for them to expire. Some weeks later, we see the protagonist arriving at an apartment and falling to the floor from exhaustion. He crawled on the floor and commented that he wanted a panda as a pet. He needed it for occasions when he came home tired from work. If he had a panda, he would be too happy because he could hug it, and that for him is like a dream. However, he would realize that reducing a panda to a pet would be unworthy for the species. He was clear about the goal that, when he exterminated humanity, he would increase the panda population in the world and they would live with them. The protagonist pondered this idea carefully. He didn't think it was a bad idea for there to be a place where pandas could roam freely and be their friends. Little by little, without realizing it, the protagonist fell asleep, fantasizing about how that world full of pandas would be where he could play with them, eat, hang out, chat, or just relax. The general soon woke up and realized that it was already dawn. He tells us that after that sudden nap, he renewed his spirits to exterminate humanity and would like to take the day off and go to the zoo. And that's what he did. He took the day off, however, he encountered a very serious question, to the point where he couldn't stop thinking about it, and that was wondering what color the tails of pandas are. He understood that they used to be white, but he wasn't sure if he should believe in this answer. Since after all, he found it strange that a panda would have a white tail despite having black ears and the rest of its limbs. He refused to believe in any external answer until he could confirm it in person, so he bought an annual pass. The protagonist asked the panda to show its tail and showed his card. He waited for two hours sitting and eating everything. He wondered if he was becoming a nuisance to the other visitors. After spending too much time there, he questioned this because he noticed that some workers and security guards were staring at him. In addition to that, in those two hours, he took so many photos of the pandas that he almost had no battery left on his phone. When he saw the panda make a gesture, he decided to take more photos, completely draining the battery of his phone, which turned off. At that moment, the panda stood up and was about to turn around, but simply decided to sit down which discouraged not only the protagonist but also the rest of the visitors. The general waited there for some more time, interpreting everything as a message from the panda and believed that he visited the panda on those days when he just wants to sit and do nothing. However, he wanted to see its tail to know what color it was and felt that everything was a test they were making him take to measure his patience. The rest of the visitors were spending their day peacefully with their families and children, buying panda-related items. Three hours later, we see that the protagonist still hasn't moved from his spot, waiting for the panda to show its tail. At that moment, both he and a child became tense when they saw the panda stand up. The bear began to walk and climbed onto a log. To climb it, it had to turn around. It was at that moment that the protagonist could see the color of the panda's tail, surprised that it was white. The child was in the same situation, 
They both looked at each other. They didn't exchange words, as the look was enough for them to communicate, and they both fist bumped, as a sign of praise for having good tastes in animals. Later, the child bid farewell to the protagonist. The latter wrote his report that same afternoon, where he recounted that it was all a tough battle. After resolving his doubt, he decided to explore the rest of the zoo to meet the other animals, visiting the rabbit's house. Once there, the protagonist would like a specific rabbit, which had the same colors as a panda. The caretaker of these rabbits appeared and asked the visitors if anyone was interested in playing with them. The caretaker clarified that adults can also come in. The protagonist decided to enter the rabbit's house, and the caretaker warned him that he could play with them as he pleased, as long as he didn't have to lift the rabbit while holding it. The protagonist was surprised to see that he had a bunch of rabbits around him. He wondered if this was another test, as he had to walk without stepping on the rabbits. The caretaker noticed and took away some rabbits. She told the protagonist that he was too popular for the rabbits, as they wouldn't let him walk. The caretaker would give him advice on how to treat the rabbits. The general crouched down and the child from the previous time appeared. He entered the rabbit's house and sat next to the protagonist, saying that the best way to start gaining the trust of the rabbits is by stroking their backs, explaining that this is because rabbits like to be petted on the back through their fur. When they get used to it, they like to be petted on the head and cheeks. The protagonist, upon seeing the child, recognized him, as he was the same one who also wanted to see the panda's tail. Out of curiosity, the protagonist asked the child if he was a zoologist. This surprised the child saying no, as he is still underage. However, he would like to become a veterinarian when he grows up. The protagonist remained silent. The child explained that his mom always tells him that becoming a veterinarian is impossible. The general decided to call the child doctor and asked him to teach him how to pet and gain the trust of the rabbits. The child was surprised by the nickname and asked why he was called doctor. The protagonist explained that he doesn't know many things about animals so he needed someone to teach him. And who better than an aspiring doctor? This excited the child, and he would give the explanation to the protagonist. While this was happening, the visitors gradually entered the rabbit's house and played with them too. The general gained the trust of one of the rabbits and was surprised at how soft their fur was. He commented that he didn't think petting a rabbit would feel so comforting. He said that Earth is a very remarkable planet. He thought about using the rabbits for work. However, he wondered if pandas would be just as soft. The child also asked himself the same question at the same time as the protagonist. They both looked at each other again and fist bumped. Gradually it was getting dark, and the child finally said goodbye to the protagonist. The latter tells us that when the day comes that he must exterminate humanity. If the child managed to become a veterinarian, he could spare him, but he denied this possibility since he was sent to Earth to end humans. Several weeks later, we see the protagonist in his office. The newcomer from the organization decided to peek to observe the general, noticing his cold expression. He assumed that the protagonist was thinking about how to eradicate humans, and they show us that. In reality, the protagonist was thinking about how to convince the organization's employees to bring rabbits to work. On a rainy night, the protagonist was walking down a street full of sheds and found the Red Ranger there. The latter was distracted looking at the rain, but was surprised to see the general. The protagonist stopped. He tells us that it's his day off and he would have loved to escape quickly, but he lost that opportunity by encountering the ranger. The Red Ranger prepared to fight, saying that they finally met again. He asked the protagonist to fight on that same street, but he refused by raising his hand and asked for another truce for today. The Red Ranger commented that this time there are no pandas or people on the street and asked if he intends to flee. He explains that his mission and the reason he trained is to defeat the invaders who are part of the evil organization. The protagonist asked him to calm down a bit. He says he wants a truce for today, as he doesn't want to work. But besides that, there's a bigger reason why he can't fight right now and it's because he's carrying two cartons of eggs in his bag. He says he likes to boil them slowly. The Red Ranger comments that boiled eggs prepared that way are usually very good. The General replies that the biggest problem with boiling eggs is that it depends a lot on how and who prepares it. He is currently practicing to boil better eggs. The Red Ranger wished him luck with that and the protagonist thanked him, as he can't afford to break the eggs. He asked him to wait on that same street and left. The ranger stayed to wait for a long time, wondering if he fled. The protagonist appeared to give the ranger an umbrella and some food. He gave him directions on how to find the subway station and then left. The ranger stopped him to ask if he didn't want to fight and the protagonist replied no, as he is still on his day off. We see a sunny day after an intense rain, 
Our protagonist woke up to the singing of birds and complained that it was too cold. He tried to turn on the heating, taking advantage of having the control next to his bed. But as soon as he took his hand out, he quickly covered himself again. It was too cold for his liking. He was somewhat annoyed since if he stayed in bed, he wouldn't enjoy his day off. So he mustered up the courage and quickly grabbed the control, managing to turn on the heating, then wrapped up as much as he could and used his cell phone to watch a daily panda video, as this was his routine. The video was about a panda doing funny things, eating, etc. Suddenly, the protagonist received a call from Rune. He was infuriated because his daily panda video session was interrupted. Then he worried that his colleagues might realize he was having a day off. He didn't hesitate to hang up the call and continued with the video. Rooney called him again. The protagonist hung up once more. Rooney insisted on calling him again. Each call was rejected by the protagonist and it went on for a long while until he decided to answer. Rooney was glad that he finally answered a call and the protagonist told him that he had become a nuisance and drove him desperate with so many calls, reminding him that he doesn't have the permission to call him on his days off. While saying this, a hologram of Rooney appeared above the cell phone. He said that he already knew that. He would realize that the protagonist had not turned on the camera and asked him if something was wrong as he couldn't see him through the screen and asked if his cell phone was broken. The protagonist stated he wasn't sure what he was referring to. Rooney deduced that he was probably doing it on purpose. Our protagonist, annoyed, warned him that if he didn't need anything, then he would hang up in two seconds. Rooney was alarmed and tried to stop him, saying that he wanted to talk to him about the appearance of an earth monster. This caught the protagonist's attention and asked him to continue, but he only had five minutes. Rooney explains that he had been investigating rumors about a monster that appears in winter and enters human homes. The protagonist asked if that monster was someone powerful. Rooney affirmed it, saying that the monster uses heat to attract humans and then traps them in its stomach. Our protagonist comments that this monster could be of help after all since it eats humans. Rooney tells him that he was thinking they could use it as a weapon for the organization. However, he let it take over him and would say it embarrassed, confessing that the monster is currently eating him from the waist down. This surprised the protagonist, who was alarmed and got out of bed, scolded him for not having notified him of this before and asked for his location. Rooney says he's in the control room. This took the protagonist by surprise, as he didn't expect such a monster to already be in the headquarters. He quickly got ready and asked for the full report. Rooney asked him if he was going to go to the headquarters. The protagonist affirmed it and asked him to hold Hold on as much as he could, Rooney asked if he could bring him tangerines on the way. The protagonist stopped and asked why he needed the tangerines. Rooney explains that this food is apparently the only thing that can feed the monster. Despite knowing it, he forgot to buy it. Our protagonist, somewhat annoyed, scolded him, since, if he knew how to manipulate the enemy with its favorite food, how could he forget about the tangerine? However, he asked him to cheer up, as just yesterday he bought a box of tangerines. Quickly the protagonist left his apartment and used his great strength to jump to the headquarters. An electric storm surrounded the building. Our protagonist managed to arrive in time and broke down the door, finding Rooney sitting in his office. He thanked him for coming and asked how he could be freed from the winter monster. The protagonist remained silent. Rooney explained that if he gets up, he freezes. He had been wanting to go to the bathroom for a while and didn't know what to do. He trusted him because, out of the entire organization, he was the one who knew human culture the best, so he must have some idea on how to counter the threats. The protagonist approached, and Rooney praised him, commenting that it had been a while since he had seen him with his hair down. Our protagonist gave Rooney a hard hit on the head and would give him the tangerines. The protagonist checked the monster while eating a tangerine. It turned out to be a table with its tablecloth. At night, we see the protagonist walking down the street, sighing as he saw the air freeze. There he met a couple eating a panda bun, which belonged to a limited edition food. The protagonist was surprised to hear this, and the woman mentioned that these buns could be found at the store nearby. Confused, the protagonist decided to look it up on his phone. The guy asked what the panda bun was filled with, and the woman explained it was meat. Our protagonist was delighted with the bun and did not hesitate to go to the nearest store, finding the panda buns. He stared at it, and the storekeeper explained that the limited edition ones are tastier than usual, so she recommended buying one. The protagonist praised her for knowing the subject and then left, saying he would come to buy a bun when he was ready. This was because it grossed him out to see a panda being broken apart. 
A few days later, he returned to the same store and bought several buns. Upon leaving, he tried a normal meat bun and was surprised that it was tasty. So, the next day, he visited the store to order pizza buns. As the days went by, he ordered different buns of various flavors to see what he would face. Many days later, the protagonist visited the store ready to eat the panda buns. It was then he realized they were no longer available. He left the place disappointed in himself because just when he had gathered the courage to eat the panda bun, they stopped selling it. Several weeks later, we see him walking down a busy street heading to the supermarket, returning after visiting the zoo and needing food for the house. There, he found some buns, surprised that they could be sold in a store other than the usual one. He did not hesitate to buy them, as they were packages that came with four buns and seemed like a bargain. Upon grabbing the package, he smiled mischievously. Two girls in the background saw the protagonist's expression and did not hesitate to flee in fear. The next day, our protagonist woke up wanting to eat the Chinese buns he bought at the supermarket. He went down to the kitchen thinking about the buns and prepared a plate of them, following the package's instructions. While waiting for them to be ready, he stretched a bit. When the microwave signaled that the buns were ready, he did not hesitate to grab the plate, but he was horrified to see that they had become smaller and fell to his knees on the floor, embarrassed by what he had done. However, he was somewhat relieved that at least they still tasted like buns. Meanwhile, we see the Red Ranger preparing some Chinese buns in the microwave, and just like the protagonist, he was horrified to see that they had become small. He wondered why that happened, and his brothers explained that it was because he wrapped them too tightly. In doing so, a vacuum is created that crushes it. Upon hearing this, the Ranger apologized to the bun for having committed such a crime. The Blue Ranger appeared, mocking the Red Ranger for not being able to make buns properly. He offered to prepare them for the entire team. However, the brothers refused, saying he makes them too hard. They showed a tool that ensures the buns come out fluffy and maintain their shape. At the same time, the protagonist discovered this tool, a plastic container. He was pleased to see the buns kept a perfect shape, unaware such a device existed, and was amazed at how fluffy the buns turned out. Several weeks later, we see the protagonist walking down the street and encountering a snowman which he mistook for a strange creature. He approached the snowman to examine it and made a snowball in front of the snowman, mimicked the snowman with the snowball, and then left. He stopped after a few seconds, realizing it was the best creation he had made with a snowball, so he took it home and stored it in his refrigerator, hoping it would remain perfect. However, as time passed, the snowman melted, which took the protagonist by surprise. He went to work utterly annoyed. During the Christmas celebration, the protagonist saw all the civilians enjoying the day and watched as snow began to fall. Although he wanted to deny it, the melting of his creation affected him because he felt he had lost a loved one. A month later, the protagonist enjoyed his day off by visiting the zoo as usual to relax with the pandas. On the way, he encountered an elderly man struggling to climb the stairs with a heavy load. The protagonist offered to help, and the elderly man did not hesitate to accept. Seeing the man's difficulty in climbing the stairs, he decided to carry the bag and the elderly man on his back. The man thanked him for being a good person and asked if he could do him a favor when he was free. He agreed and began to feel strange when the elderly man stroked his hair in gratitude. Although he wanted to deny it, deep down, he liked the sensation. He took the man to his destination and said goodbye, wondering if perhaps the man had mistaken him for his grandson or something similar. He quickly covered his eyes to hide his sadness, lamenting that humans are so ephemeral. The next day, the protagonist dreamed of pandas and counted each one. Suddenly, his dream changed to a neighborhood decorated for Christmas, and he wondered where he was, believing he had been transported to a strange dimension. There he met Santa, who greeted him, saying he was happy to see him and asked if he could help him again. The protagonist realized it was the same person he had helped, and Santa offered him clothes to withstand the cold. The protagonist put them on, and Santa quickly took the protagonist with the reindeer, who were carrying gifts for the children. Our protagonist carried the gifts and accompanied the elves, decorated a Christmas tree, and made a giant snowman. He asked Santa if he does all that work, which Santa confirmed. The protagonist advised him to retire, as he is too old. Santa replied that he would like to continue working as long as there are children who believe in his existence. Even if it's just a story they forget when they grow up, as long as they believe he exists, he will live in their hearts and fulfill every wish, one by one. Then, he thanked the protagonist for his help, confessing he knows his secret of being from another planet, and wished him a Merry Christmas. After this, Santa left on his reindeer. The protagonist woke up with a sore body from the work he had done, 
unaware that he had a gift in his house sent and personally written by Santa for being kind-hearted despite his origins. We see a boy returning from work completely exhausted. He went to the supermarket and bought several things. He explains to us that he recently started working in the spring. He was eager to live on his own for once. After work, he planned to go out drinking with his colleagues from the company. He would even go to the gym. On his days off he wanted to visit all kinds of places or that was the plan he had. But he had no more strength due to tiredness and if he didn't return home to do the laundry, he would run out of underwear. He also tells us that he would have liked to cook. But when he gets home, he doesn't even have time for that. He couldn't continue living like this as it was too expensive for him. In the end, he always gave up and became depressed because of how badly he did everything. In one of the aisles he came across our protagonist. The boy trembled with fear when he saw him. He thought he was a dangerous person from the city, like a gang member. The supermarket manager approached the protagonist to greet him. The boy was surprised that the protagonist got along well with the manager. The protagonist asked the girl what had happened to the shelves of Chinese buns. She explains that they were removed because the promotion had ended. They only had buns until early April. These words discouraged the protagonist. The boy was impressed that the protagonist looked tremendously disappointed for not being able to eat buns. The girl apologized to the protagonist, as she knew that those buns were his favorites, as he always bought them after work. The boy identified with the protagonist and was glad not to be the only one who buys food on the way home from work. Our protagonist explains that the buns were like his reward for working hard and he needed them to keep going. The girl tried to cheer him up by telling him that he could look for another type of reward and revealed to him that there are new seasonal frozen products. The protagonist looked up and decided to follow the girl to show him the new products. The boy saw them leave and wondered if he should also reward himself, as he always focused on the negative and never thought about himself. He decided to buy a dessert he liked and felt a little happier. The next day, the boy returned to the supermarket much more animated and bought another dessert. The manager approached him to explain that those desserts are on promotion, and at the moment they have a cherry promotion. The boy was surprised to hear that there were more flavors and asked if the one he had in his hand was tasty. She recommended it to him, saying it's her favorite. We change scene to the protagonist walking through a square while tasting a cherry-flavored milkshake, which was part of the supermarket promotions. He wondered if cherries tasted like that. Suddenly, he came across a cherry tree and decided to try the leaf. He wanted to know if they both tasted the same. The next night, the same boy checked the store's products, wondering what he could reward himself with today. The protagonist entered the store and the girl greeted him. She mentioned that she was a little worried about him, as she didn't know if he was going to come to buy. The boy noticed that the manager had something important to tell the protagonist and thought it would be a declaration of love. However, he was disappointed to hear that she only wanted to promote new ice creams. The protagonist became interested and asked her to tell him more about it. The boy couldn't help but follow them and listen to the conversation out of curiosity, finding out about the existence of an ice cream with fruit. The protagonist decided to choose a different ice cream than the one the girl recommended. The latter apologized to him, thinking she had messed up. But the protagonist asked her not to worry, as he will also try the ice cream she recommended, since she always gets it right with her recommendations. The girl, seeing that the protagonist wanted to buy the two new ice creams, tried to stop him, explaining that it was a mistake. The protagonist revealed to her that he shouldn't attach importance to differences of opinion, as he would have visited the store another day anyway to buy the missing new ice cream. After seeing them leave, the boy approached the freezer and rewarded himself with the same ice creams as the protagonist. We see our protagonist returning to his apartment and observing the ice creams, wondering which one to try first, as tomorrow would be his first day off in a long time. The next morning, he decided to visit a cafe in search of something called latte art. Upon entering the store, he was greeted by the employees and took a seat. He saw the coffee machine and was surprised. He had never seen anything like it and wondered what kind of technology it was. He even thought it could be some sort of experimental instrument. The employee asked the protagonist how he wanted his coffee, and he gave him the instructions. Our protagonist watched carefully as the employee used the machine, and upon seeing the coffee's reaction to heating, he couldn't help but ask what it was. The employee explained that it was a siphon coffee maker, and although filtered coffee is good, they usually make coffee this way. The employee served a hot cup to another customer who was there, and the protagonist was somewhat amazed that there was more than one way to make coffee. However, he couldn't help but feel threatened as he was totally unfamiliar with the sounds of the machines and didn't understand what was happening. After a while, the employee served the coffee to the protagonist, along with a panda design. 
The dark-haired man didn't hesitate to take a photo of the coffee, saying it looked as adorable as the rumors said. After taking several photos, he wondered how to drink that coffee and couldn't help but imitate the man next to him. But he was horrified to see that as he drank the coffee, the panda drawing deformed. This seemed to him like a too cruel torture. Soon, he heard the voice of the panda that was in the coffee, asking the protagonist to calm down, as that was their inevitable destiny. Our protagonist carefully observed the coffee, watching as the panda design disappeared. He couldn't help but feel bad and drank all the coffee at once. The man next to the protagonist was moved by the situation and decided to pay for another similar coffee for the protagonist. Later, we see him returning to his apartment struggling with several bags. He explains that he got so excited about the panda design coffee that he ended up buying too much. All the bags weighed so much that he doubted his shoulder would dislocate at some point. Although he knew this could happen, as he also carried a large amount of milk to make stew, cream, and some almond jelly. He wanted to try something, as anything made in stew seemed delicious to him. Although he knew that baked rice, pasta, and omelets could be used in a wide variety of dishes. Starting next week, he would work for several days without rest and wanted to cook in advance a dish that would be worth it. He planned that when he made creams and flans, he would decorate them with pandas, as he was inspired by the panda design on the coffee. He had some hope that his experiment would turn out well, although he anticipated a certain level of failure, so he bought extra milk for that reason. In addition to that, he wanted to serve all the dishes he would make in panda dishes that he found by chance in a store. Upon arriving at his tired apartment, he looked at the stairs leading to the second floor. He felt he was facing a great enemy, and wondered why humans didn't install elevators in places like this. However, he didn't want to give up, much less would he let himself be defeated. He took a breath and placed a foot on the step, slowly climbing the stairs, feeling how the bags dug forcefully into his shoulders and hands, it was too exhausting of a task. Due to the effort, he felt like his fingers would break at any moment. To not give up, he reminded himself why he bought so many extra things, motivating himself with the thought of making stew in a panda bowl. He asked his own body to hold on a little longer, looked up, and could see the end of his long journey. After so much effort, he finally managed to climb the last step and couldn't help but smile in relief. However, he found a boy looking at him strangely. Later, during a blood moon, we see the protagonist fighting against the rangers, specifically the red one. He ran alongside him on the warehouse roofs and tried to strike the red ranger, who dodged the attack and jumped to the ground. The protagonist chased him, and they clashed their blows, creating shockwaves that swept everything in their path. The Red Ranger unleashed a flurry of blows against the protagonist, who managed to dodge them all without much effort and when he saw the opportunity, he defeated him. We switch scenes to our protagonist on his day off. He decided to visit a new area of the city he hadn't been to before. He wanted to contemplate the cherry blossoms as humans usually do, but he realized the flowers had already disappeared. He felt somewhat disappointed, as he had even prepared a snack for the occasion. Then we see a scene of the protagonist watching the news, where the reporter gave advice on how to enjoy cherry trees, including carrying some food. Our protagonist felt a little relieved to see that cherry blossoms were still falling from the tree, but he noticed a girl there, playing. She was picking up each flower and felt observed. She turned to look at the protagonist, and both watched each other for a while without saying a word. The girl approached him and took the box with food. The protagonist understood what was going on, so he decided to sit on the bench next to the girl and shared his food with her. The protagonist asked her if her parents never told her not to accept food from strangers. She replied that they did, and the protagonist asked her if she was too hungry to ignore that rule, which the girl affirmed. Our protagonist touched his face to relax a bit, as he was bothered by the idea that parents would leave a child hungry, and he promised her that he would exterminate humanity in her name. The girl mentioned that she wanted more food, and the protagonist told her she could eat everything in the box. The child did nothing but continue eating and asked if he wanted to see the cherry trees. The protagonist replied yes, although he realized he had arrived too late. He decided to pour himself something to drink and shared this with the girl, asking her to be careful while eating. The girl mentioned that she would show him the cherry trees. She showed her hand, where there were a bunch of cherry blossoms, and these flew away, guided by the wind. The protagonist stood watching the cherry blossoms. Here, he explains to us that, unlike the flora of his home planet, which retains its flowers until they wither, on Earth, there existed the cherry tree, which scatters its petals shortly after blooming. He had read that according to humans, this event is considered elegant, and he had no doubt that this was the case, as he was fascinated by how the cherry blossoms moved and adorned the environment. 
The protagonist comments that seeing the flowers fall was something beautiful, and he realized that the girl had disappeared, leaving only a nest of cherry blossoms. He wondered if she had returned home. During the following days, he went to the same place several times with food, but he never saw the girl again. So, he hopes to meet her again next year when the cherry trees bloom again. Here, we discover that the girl who was with the protagonist was the spirit of the tree who decided to show the event to the protagonist person. We are introduced to the pink ranger named Aurora. We see her standing atop a hill and she would summon her pink suit. She would look disdainfully at the monsters working for the evil organization, and she tells us about defeating the protagonist. To achieve this, she patrols every day and fights any threat she encounters, needing only one blow to send any opponent flying. However, she has gradually become tired of the work, mainly because the suit is too tight for her body and she was tired of fighting senselessly. She decided to take a day off and went to her apartment to watch a series of magical girls. Aurora found all the girls in the program cute and reveals that deep down she has always wanted to be a magical girl. Aurora lamented wearing the ranger suit with so little style and contacted her organization to report that she defeated the enemy. She decided to continue patrolling the city until nightfall. She returned to her apartment and made herself a magic wand, imitating the design of one of her favorite magical girl's wands. Aurora comments that she will keep that wand in her bag as a lucky charm. Aurora decided to go out and met the Blue Ranger, who asked her where she wanted to go. Aurora didn't want to say anything, fearing that the whole team would start teasing her if they found out she liked magical girls. The Blue Ranger complained about Aurora, saying she never shows any sweetness. Aurora ignored him, mentioning that if he wanted to chat with someone adorable, he could go to the Red Ranger. The twins appeared to scold the Blue Ranger for trying to pick a fight with Aurora and asked her where she was going. Aurora explained that she was trying to substitute for the Black Ranger in her patrol. After this, she left. Aurora walked the streets sadly and tells us that she recognizes that she is not someone adorable. She checked every corner and alley of the block, trying to find another magic wand that she lost. She ended up in a park and there she found a sleeping cat on a bench. She wanted to pet it, but when she saw that the feline refused, she decided to leave. She went to the police station to ask about the lost and found box. The only officers on duty returned Aurora her magic wand explaining that someone had recently dropped it off at the station and told her that they were probably still nearby. Upon hearing this, Aurora ran off to find that person. Meanwhile, the Red Ranger returned to the apartment and the twins told him about the fight between Blue and Aurora. One of the twins was worried that Aurora might commit a crime because of Blue. Red decided to scold Blue, saying he can't make kids cry. However, Blue defended himself, explaining that the only person crying is him, and it's due to the pain. The twins thought about calling the Black Ranger to look for Aurora. Blue denied this, explaining that if Rosa didn't return in 10 minutes, he would go look for her. Back with Aurora, she continued searching for the person who left the magic wand at the police station, trying to find someone who matched the description given by the officers. As she searched, she saw the protagonist in the distance and ran towards him, taking him by surprise. Our protagonist stayed alert and looked at Aurora. She asked him if he was the one who left the magic wand with the police. The protagonist affirmed it and wanted to know if she was the owner. Aurora thanked him for rescuing the magic wand. The black-haired guy advised her to be more careful with the things she treasures so they don't get lost again. Aurora fell silent, accepting the scolding, but she was surprised to hear the protagonist call her a magical girl. It was the first time anyone had called her that, and she wondered if the protagonist knew the series. She couldn't help but feel glad that someone called her that because deep down, she always wished for it. She decided to return to the apartment, taking care of her wand. She thought she should store it better next time so it wouldn't get lost. On the way back, she met Blue, who scolded her for being out on the street in the early hours, clarifying that the rest of the team was worried about her. He asked if she found what she was looking for, and Aurora affirmed it. They returned together to the apartment, and Aurora was careful not to be discovered by Blue. The next day, we see the protagonist walking to the zoo to see the pandas. We are shown a flashback where the protagonist spent some time observing one and wondered what kind of power pandas had to be so adorable, even to someone from another planet. Back in the present, the protagonist tells us that lately the streets he usually travels are filling up with pandas, whether they are figures, food, accessories, clothes, etc. However, that wasn't the only thing because he also encountered many posters of the Magical Girls series. Out of curiosity, he looked at the poster and realized that one of the characters is a panda with wings. He judged the design and concluded that pandas with wings look even more adorable. 
He reached the Unohara Commercial District and was surprised to find the area celebrating a panda fair. Out of curiosity, the protagonist went to the fair and encountered a panda mascot, which was greeting children by shaking their hands. The protagonist joined to shake hands with the panda, but it gave him a festival stamp instead. The attendant explained that he needed to collect 10 stamps, and if he did, he could exchange them for a special prize. The protagonist felt somewhat disappointed to only receive one stamp and read the event rules, discovering that he only needed to buy products from the commercial district to win a prize, which would be handed out by pandas. He understood the concept and visited every store to buy things, prioritizing food, buying panda-shaped bread although he found it difficult to choose. He bought a panda-shaped donut and was amazed to see a panda-shaped bread mold. He didn't like the idea much, but he thought it would give him more pandas, so he decided to buy several breads with different thicknesses. He visited a Chinese store to buy panda items, went to a supermarket to buy panda products, and also bought panda sweets. He checked the stamp and realized he only needed one more purchase to win the prize. Later, he finished filling the stamp and went to exchange it for his prize. The elderly woman showed him a list of items he could choose from. The protagonist reviewed them, they were panda mugs, glasses, blankets, picnic lunchboxes, bags, and colored pencils, all with a panda aesthetic. Here he suffered a crisis because he didn't know what to choose from so many things. He was like this for a long time and decided to exchange the stamp for a panda mug. After this, he returned to his apartment happily, stored all the things he bought, and went to sleep. The next morning, the protagonist took another day off and decided to clean his apartment. Over the month, he had been working so much that he neglected his apartment, so he decided to do some cleaning. He took a vacuum cleaner and started dusting. He used the vacuum cleaner according to the tips he had heard, as he was aware that vacuums suck harder when pulling than when pushing. He was meticulous with the cleaning until it was time to clean the sofa. There he had a panda plush, and unintentionally, he hit the sofa, causing the plush to fall to the floor. The protagonist was alarmed, so he stopped cleaning to wash his hands and put the plush back in its place. He checked the closet and organized all his clothes. After finishing, he remembered he didn't have any cleaning fluid. He found several boxes of food with panda drawings on them. These boxes were empty, and he thought about throwing them away. However, he decided to keep them since most of them were gifts from his co-workers. He got a bucket of water and cleaned the windows for several hours. He decided to take a break and browse the internet to watch panda videos. While looking for a video of his interest, he came across a recent one, which was a special video recorded by the city's panda caretakers. He didn't hesitate to watch the entire video, forgetting that he had left clothes in the washing machine and causing a small accident. Later, we see the protagonist sitting on a bench admiring the scenery. He was somewhat relieved that the clothes weren't damaged, but they had to stay outside longer than usual. Suddenly, he sensed someone was by his side. He turned around and saw a cat, which sat down next to him. He was surprised that a cat would sit with him. He knew that the attitude and charm of these animals made them difficult to deal with. But at the same time, they were favorites of humans. Our protagonist thought of a plan to exterminate humanity using this weakness against humans. Furthermore, he liked the cat as a potential recruit because its color resembled that of a panda. The protagonist cleared his throat and greeted the cat, saying it was a beautiful day. The feline simply remained seated in silence and looked away. Our protagonist took this as a kind of challenge, as no other living being had dared to ignore him and look away. He saw this as a strength as well because it could come in handy for the extermination plan. However, he thought about the possibility of having offended the cat, as he knew they existed since ancient times and feared he had been rude. He started treating the cat as a sir. The feline glanced at him for a few seconds but continued to ignore him. The protagonist took this as an achievement because he managed to make such an ancient being look at him. He would feel superior to humans because of this. But he was surprised when the cat started meowing several times. Our protagonist thought that cats spoke another language and felt stupid for forgetting such an obvious detail. He felt even worse because he feared the cat wouldn't understand his speech due to the language difference. However, he believed the cat was meowing out of courtesy and thought of a goodwill response on the topic. The protagonist took some time to learn the language of cats, mastering it in seconds. Soon, he started meowing along with the cat, and they communicated in that way. All of this was being observed by Aurora, who was hiding in a tree. She covered her mouth to avoid being discovered. She found it too adorable to see the protagonist meowing with the cat, and she discovered it by chance during her patrol hour. If you've reached this part of the video, comment the word villain in the comments. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of this anime.